Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you today, whether you're here in the theater or joining us on our YouTube station. Before we hear from Sheila Tate on her new biography of Nancy Reagan, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. On Friday, April 6th at noon, that's tomorrow, we'll celebrate the 100th anniversary of First Lady Betty Ford's birth with a screening of Betty Ford, The Real Deal, a PBS documentary that profiles Betty Ford, her time in the White House, her advocacy for civil rights, and the founding of the Betty Ford Center in California. Then on Monday, April 9th at noon, Hendrik Hartog will be here to talk about his new book, The Trouble with Minna, A Case of Slavery and Emancipation in, anti in the Antebellum North, which uses a forgo forgotten 1840 case to explore the regime of gradual emancipation that took place in New Jersey. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our calendar of events online at archives.gov. Check out our website to sign up, or there's a table outside the theater where you can get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activity, and there are applications for membership in the lobby also. The Presidential Library is oper operated by the National Archives and Records Administration have a wealth of information about the presidents who created them. First ladies are well represented in the records since their official and personal papers are also housed in these libraries. But there's more to a library than the president and the first lady. Each presidential library possesses collections from close associates of the president, such as friends and administration officials. These papers and oral histories allow us to see multiple facets of the president and the first lady, supplementing and elaborating on the information in the first couple's own records. Today, we're fortunate to hear firsthand observations of Nancy Reagan, first lady for eight years in the 1980s and a steadfast, lifelong partner to her husband, President Ronald Reagan. Sheila Tate's new book, Lady in Red, an intimate portrait of Nancy Reagan, allows us personal insights into Mrs. Reagan's life in the White House. Mrs. Tate served as press secretary to First Lady Nancy Reagan from 1981 to 1985, handling some of the most newsworthy and controversial issues of the first Reagan term. After leaving the White House staff, she and Jody Powell formed a White House press, former pr White House press secretary to President Jimmy Carter, founded Powell Tate, which quickly became one of Washington's most successful public affairs firms. She served as president and vice, pres vice chairman of the firm for over 20 years. Additionally, Mrs. Tate served two to five-year terms as vice chairman and chairman of the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, appointed by both Presidents Reagan and Bush, and she has held a number of additional positions in press and public affairs offices, organizations. In 2001, Washingtonian Magazine named her one of the 100 most powerful women in Washington. In 1999, PR Week selected her as one of the 50 most powerful women in public relations and one of the 100 most influential PR people of the 20th century. She was named to the Public Relations Society of America's National Capitol Hall of Fame in 2015. And to lead our discussion, we have Carl Cannon, the Washington Bureau Chief of Real Clear Politics and Executive Editor of Real Clear Media Group. He's a past recipient of the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for Distinguished Reporting and the Aldo Beckman Award, the two most prestigious awards for White House coverage. He was a 2007 fellow in residence at Harvard University's Institute of Politics and is a past president of the White House Correspondents Association. Carl has covered every presidential campaign and midterm election since 1984. He was a member of the San Jose Mercury News staff that received a Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and is the author and co-author of several books, including Reagan's Disciple, George W. Bush's Troubled Quest for a Presidential Legacy, written with his father, Lou Cannon. His most recent book, On This Date, From the Pilgrims to Today, Discovering America One Day at a Time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sheila Tate and Carl Cannon.
Here we are. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Um, Hi, everybody. Hi. So, is that Larry Bird? No, we're down to some of the better reporters left in oh, the world. Uh, so, you heard um, Sheila Tate's um, official biography. Um, I can give you her unofficial bio in five <laughs> words. Uh, Larry Barrett will remember this. There's Larry. It's right here. Uh, five words. She always returned reporters' calls. Can you hear me? Is this mic working? Can you hear me? How about now? Wave your hand if you can. Yes, in the back? OK, I mumble sometimes, so don't hesitate to speak up if I start doing that again. Sheila Tate always returned your call. I came here, lowly regional reporter from the San Jose Mercury News, and one day I'd been here about two weeks, and Nancy had done something, and the paper wanted a story on it. So I called her press office, certain I wouldn't get a call back, and she would take call me back in less than an hour. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted when, when uh, Doug Swanson asked me to do this, I didn't even take an hour. I just said yes. Uh, are you ready? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to always stump, ready. I'm going to stump you here. I All think. right. Uh, okay. Very hardball questions. Sheila, if you were a tree, what kind of, <laughs> oh, what yeah. kind of tree would you be? <laughs> that was one of the dumbest questions I ever heard. And, and you know, I Tell went out. In the background. Well, Barbara Walters was the very first person to walk into my new office as I be just after I was announced as the press secretary, and. I, I walked into the transition office, and she's sitting at a chair next to my desk. She'd flown down from New York. She wanted to be the first one there. She wanted to get the first interview. And, that, and I thought that was pretty impressive. So, so I did lobby for her, but she didn't get the first interview, but she got one of the first. And, her, and, did, and then she used her time to ask Nancy Reagan what kind of a tree she would be. It was, so, I was so embarrassed. Well, I, I, there was a, there was a backstory there that was interesting. She did interview, Barbara Walters had interviewed um, Catherine Hepburn early in the year, and Hepburn had volunteered that she was a tree, and Barbara Walters looked surprised. She said, "Well, what kind of a tree are you?" I can't remember what Kate Hepburn said, but somehow well, Barbara Walters thought, "Well, this is a good question. I'll ask this of other people," <laughs> and she asked Nancy, "Do you remember Nancy's answer?" "I don't." "An oak," she said, and. If you, if you looked at this little bitty thing, size zero, you wouldn't think oak. But I, would, I guess I would say, if you read this book here, and I hope that you all do, um, at the end of it, you, would conclude, you might conclude that Nancy Reagan was an oak. Yep, there was a, there was a lot about her to admire, I think. Um, you, you write, Sheila, about the assassination and its effect on Nancy. And, mm -hmm effect on the White House. And I, I sometimes fear people are going to forget the bear. I know. James Brady, I the know. White House press secretary, grievously wounded um, in, that, in that assassination attempt, never really recovered. Never. Uh, but he was instrumental in you getting hired at South Yes. I, I would never have been there except for, I'm, I'm convinced, except for Jim. He, uh, after, I ta after I interviewed with Nancy Reagan, they set in motion a process where, where I was in, and I and others were being interviewed by a succession of people, including uh, Mike Deaver, Tish Baldridge, and Nancy Reynolds, who were running her transition. And the last person was Jim Brady. And he said to me, it's down to two people. I said, well, then I want the job. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, I don't want to lose to one other person. And he said, well, I've decided I'm voting for you. And it was a Friday. And I went back to my office. It was the first time I thought, I might really get this job. And within an hour or so, I got a call from Nancy Reagan asking me if I would take the position. I said, absolutely. And um, Had you met her before? No, never. And how did you two hit it off initially? I was a nervous wreck. Um, and we sat down to talk. And my hands were shaking like this. So I did this. I just sat on my hands the whole time. And I just listened to her, and I asked her some, a few questions. She told me right then that she wanted to get involved in youth drug abuse. And um, I never asked her why at that point. I, I thought it was kind of a heavy subject for her to be considering. But, uh, but she never said exactly what the job was. And I learned, later figured out she had originally hired um, um, a society reporter to be her press secretary from California. And 
there were a couple of serious missteps, and, and she decided that was not going to be the right fit. She didn't want to, she didn't, she wanted to get her reassigned somewhere um, and, and, the, and tell her, you know, that she was hiring somebody else. She didn't want her to find out beforehand. When you think of Jim Brady, big, gruff, irreverent, yeah. you, and then you think he wouldn't be Nancy's kind of guy, but she, she apparently listened to him. Oh, she loved, so, she loved, oh, everybody did. I mean, how could you not listen to Jim? Jim, I had a circumstance the very first state dinner was going to be for Margaret Thatcher. And I, I went and sat with uh, Sheila Weidenfeld, for instance, any, any former uh, press secretary to get help in understanding how to handle the press at a state function. And they were very helpful. And, and so I submitted my proposal, and um, a social secretary got it and changed it. She said she thought it was too intrusive, that it wasn't tasteful for the press to be here and there and the other place. And so I went to Jim Brady and I said, help. And he, he I, won't, I won't use his language, but he said, <laughs> he said, what in the heck do they think we're doing these state dinners for? I mean, it's, it's for the press. And what he meant really was, we have to have press coverage in order to convey to the world the relationship between these two countries and the diplomatic importance of this event. And and he's saying this as he's dragging me to Mike Deaver's office. And, and Mike Deaver instantly just crossed it all out and said, go back to what you play in. So, I mean, and that was the first of many times that Jim helped me. And the other thing he did is he insisted that I attend the West Wing uh, daily meeting of the press. And apparently that was unusual. So I would, we always made sure you know, nobody was stepping on, we weren't stepping on each other by not knowing what, what each, whether the East Wing or the West Wing was doing. Um, for those of you who don't know, the East Wing, we use that, we mean the First Lady's office, right. West Wing, the President's office. Sheila, you write, you know, Ronald Reagan recovered from that, shot in the chest and recovered, mm -hmm. you know, 70 years old. Uh, but, uh, but you write in your book that you thought it took Nancy longer to recover than Reagan. But, well, he thought so, too. I mean, she was, she was, uh, and I think, I can't prove it, but it's my instinct that that started the um, interest in consulting with an astrologist. Um, she felt it was some, somehow made her feel better to know that if he went this day, it was safer than if he went that day. Um, she never told you about that at the time? Never. I never, I never knew about it until Don Regan's book came out. Well, she Don never used that for herself. We used to sit and schedule her and months in advance, and she never changed anything. Well, I guess Don Regan got his revenge since Nancy basically fired him. Well, he, he deserved to <laughs> he be fired. He was the chief of staff. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hang up on a first lady. Yeah. The, so that story related in your book. Don Regan is talking to the first lady. I imagine the conversation is getting tense. He hung up on her. Mm -hmm. this, so it leaked somewhere. And Reagan didn't Well, know we know how it leaked. Okay, how did it leak? Nancy Reynolds was sitting there when it happened. She walked out of the White House and ran into Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace ran to the studio, got on air, and announced it. And they, the president heard it on TV. So yeah, that's the great scene in your book. They're yeah. watching the news together. And Reagan turns to his wife, said, "Did this happen?" Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's exactly. probably the end of Don Regan, the beginning of the end. Exactly right. Um, so the title of this book is "Lady in Red." But you, by the way, I've never told anybody this, but I also witnessed their. Um, but Nancy and, Ron, and um, Don Regan making up. And it was at their portrait. I almost thought you said making out. Making up. Okay. <laughs> at their portrait unveiling at the, in the oh, Bush oh, White House. Oh, after. Donald Regan came, and, and I noticed Donald Regan get in the receiving line. So I raced up to get right behind him so I could see what was going on. <laughs> and, and he stopped in front of Nancy Regan. They looked at each other. She smiled at him. They kissed and started laughing. How about that? And I think that's that a, was, that's a nice story. Yeah, that was the end of it. All right, so Lady in Red, uh -huh. and in a portrait. But look, how did Red become? How did Nancy choose Red as her color? She, how did that she just always looked great in red. She I mean, looked great in a gunny sack, Sheila. She well, looked, but red was really her color, right. and she loved it. Uh, you mentioned Nancy's elegance and compare her in your book with uh, Jackie Kennedy. 
uh, and Melania Trump. What, what would Nancy have think, thought of Melania Trump? What would she think of this current first lady? Well, I'm sure she would think she was gorgeous. Um, the one thing I know is that she, she felt, and she said to us when we, we tried to encourage her to think about doing something besides drug abuse, she said that she want, if she was going to be in the White House for four or eight years, she wanted to do something she really cared about. And she said, I really care about this issue. So this is what I want to do. And we, so we, the resistance caved in at that point. And um, that's the advice she'd give to Melania Trump. Find something you really love, and that's what you should pursue. Something that will be really helpful to people. That's good. Why do you think um, drug abuse was the issue? Why, why do you think that mattered so much to her? I don't know. I think, she, you know, she was appalled by the era of, um, what's his name, Tim uh, Leary. Leary, Tim Leary, yeah, and and uh, LSD. Yeah, and and also, um, um, Art Linkletter's daughter killed herself uh, supposedly in a flashback from LSD, and and she threw herself off a building. And he was a friend of theirs, and I think that had a big influence on her, too. Um, all right, so let's recreate the scene. It's March of 1982. The economy is in recession. The president, who'd won in a near landslide less than two years before, uh, his pop two years before, his, his popularity is down. The Democrats are running in the midterms against Reaganomics. And Nancy is being criticized from everything from uh, the new White House China, mm -hmm. never mind that it was bought with private funds, but it wasn't the right signal, some people thought, to designer gowns that she borrowed for state dinners. Uh, even jo Johnny Carson said on The Tonight Show her favorite food was caviar. Right, I remember that. Uh, then comes the gridiron dinner. Now, I wasn't there, I was a pup at the time, but you were there. And, it was. Uh, I, I thought I knew this story, but I've never seen an account like you have in Lady in Red. Uh, remind our audience of what Nancy did that year, and then I'll ask you a couple of follow-up questions. What do you mean what she did that year? The song. Oh, yeah. You mean at the gridiron? Yes. Well, what happened was, um, I mean, we, I knew how bad things were, and, and I, I thought, that I knew the gridiron was coming up, and I thought, she is such a good target. It's, I'm sure they're going to go after her and singe while not burning her. And um, so I first went to uh, Mike Deaver and Jim Brady, and I asked them, I said, I'm going to go propose this to Nancy, <clears throat> that she make an appearance at the gridiron. Will you back me up? Because she's going to call you guys and check it out. And they said, absolutely, do it. So um, I went upstairs and talked to her. We got Landon Parvin involved. Let me interrupt you for one minute. Right. You'd got wind that they were doing a song, on the club, on a, a kind of spoofing Nancy. Not then. I just assumed okay. they would. I okay. grew up here. I, I so used you, to follow uh, the gridiron. I okay. knew. I knew what so was going. So you knew this was coming. Yeah. All right. And um, and uh, so she not only agreed, but she sort of took charge of the whole thing, and. Um, we started getting together, and, and well, actually, before even saying that, so once she said yes, she would do it, I go back to my office. Charlie McDowell, the president of the Gridiron, is already sitting there waiting. He's, he's so excited about it. Helen Thomas had called him and told him, and, and they said they would adore having her there, and they kept it a secret. And um, so they gave me a... Uh, copy of the lyrics that were already being rehearsed about Nancy Reagan. So I knew I was right. And, and they gave me a typed suggestion for how she should respond. And it was basically a back of the hand kind of thing. So Giving it back to the press. Right. So, and we knew that that was exactly the wrong. I took it up to her and she said, no, I can't do that. I got to make fun of myself. So that was Nancy's idea. She got that. Absolutely. And then, and then that's when we got Landon and we sat down and we hashed out the lyrics to Secondhand Rose. Which was a Barbara Streisand song. Right. And you made it Secondhand Close. Right. Well, the, the gridiron had already I see. used that theme, okay. so we just picked up on it. And uh, it, was a, it was great. It was, a, it was one of the most significant moments in terms of watching opinion change in a room that I've ever... So, she, so she's up at the head table with the president. You're at the right. head table. Right. 
There's, no, there, I'm not at the head you're table. You're not the I'm head da- table? I'm down with the... You're, you had a, okay. You know, and there were a couple of publishers you overheard when Nancy left the stage, they she, said to one another... One was, I had one on each side, and the, and the one on this side leaned behind me and said to the guy over here, Nancy Reagan has just left the room. I bet she's pissed. <laughs> and, and, and I honestly can tell you, I think that's how people assumed she would react. And instead, she goes, changes in this ridiculous costume. She changes costume. into this incredible costume <laughs> that, that was put, actually, it's most stuff stolen from Muffy Brandon's daughter, okay. you know. And, um, it's like the female version of the dude in the Big Lebowski, this oh, it's awful. outfit she had. And then she bursts for, forth on the stage from behind a, a rack of clothing. And at first, people did not know it was her. And when they discovered it, you started hearing the room started screaming. She bursts into song. She has a fake uh, plate that looks like a dish of rig in China. She tries to slam it on the floor. It doesn't break. So they start screaming for an encore. So she goes through her whole routine again, takes that plate again, and it smashes it into smithereens. And the, I mean, the room just rose like as one. And just, I mean, I'm, you could, it was a, fee, a true feeling that everyone's attitude had just changed and they were going to give her a second chance. Well, and, and she took full advantage, <coughs> excuse me, full advantage of it. And uh, so uh, the last verse for those of you who weren't there, and I wasn't there, uh, secondhand clothes, I'm wearing secondhand clothes. Uh, they're all the same. They're all the thing in the spring fashion shows. Even my new trench coat with fur collar, mm-hmm. Ronnie bought for 10 cents on the dollar. The China is the only thing that's new, even though they tell me I'm no longer queen. Did Ronnie have to buy me that new sewing machine? Secondhand clothes, secondhand clothes. I sure hope Ed me sews. And uh, I found out something in this book. You wrote that last line. I did. That was the only. That was my. Landon Parvin wrote the rest of it. Basically, Landon let you write one line. Well, that yeah. was nice. He, well, he was sort of stymied. He says, eh. and I said, I sure hope Ed me sews. And you know, so that was my line. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so that began to change this thing that had dogged Nancy since Sacramento. Queen Nancy, the mm-hmm. iron butterfly, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you, and that was the beginning of it. Yep. All right, let me ask you, because I, th- you know, most Americans weren't at the gridiron. You have all these reporters there. They can be more sympathetic to Nancy Reagan. But in my mind, the iconic thing, and I wanted to ask you about it, I don't think it's in your book, was when she sat on Mr. T's lap. Mm-hmm. This was uh, Mr. T from... At uh, Christmas. The A-team. The A-team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's this big, burly guy with a mohawk, and she sat in his lap as part of the Just Say No mm-hmm. publicity. Yep. He, he was very committed to being anti-drug, and he really wanted to be involved in it. We brought him in as Santa Claus at Christmas. Every year we got a different Santa Claus. He was Santa Claus. Did, so, and w- what did Nancy say about that? What did she... What? She loved him. He, he, he was at her memorial service. Was he? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll, I'll, I want to tell you two stories, short ones, about Nancy. You know, they left office, and she'd had this long evolution. But she, her reputation from the Sacramento days really till, till Reagan, when the president died, mm-hmm. was this long period of people taking second looks at her and thinking mm-hmm. they'd been hard mm-hmm. on her and like Don Regan forgiving her or apologizing even right. in print some right. I don't know that Joan Didion ever did I'll get to that in a minute yeah. but <clears throat> but I wanted to ask you because I, I think of well uh, two quick stories one is my father Lou Cannon who covered Reagan the whole time he was here uh, for the Washington Post and also in Sacramento for right. the San Jose American News with Larry Barrett of Time who's in our audience today and, and many other distinguished people but one time when I first came to Washington myself, I thought, well, I'll go through the receiving line at the Christmas party with my dad because then I'll get special treatment. <laughs> so we go through the line, and one of my brothers was there, and, you know, the Marine guard says, Lou Cannon, Carl Cannon. They keep trying to move you. Really yeah, and so the president won't, uh, you know, forget you if, you know, if, he's, right. if you're his brother, right? Right. Anyway, so we come to the line, and Reagan, Merry Christmas, no recognition at all. We come to Nancy, and she... It was some sort of trick, like Bam Bam in the Flintstones. She picks us up, this little, moves us out of the line. The super, no recognition at all. My father knew Reagan well. He'd written books about him. And I said to my dad, that's kind of weird. He said, yeah, it was strange, wasn't it? And then he went off and joined his friends and had drinks and never mentioned it again. A week later, he calls me. I'm working late, and he's at the party, 
loud, at, in Palm Springs with the, at the Annenberg uh -huh. party. New he says, hey, I just thought you'd like to hear some. I said, Reagan just spotted me and yelled my name across the room. I said, what's the punch sign? He says, well, Nancy isn't here. And what had happened was he had written a story that, he, that Reagan was going deaf and it infuriated Nancy. Oh, so he didn't dare be nice. Yeah, she, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the book end of that story is years later at the christening of the USS Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. we went, Nancy was as sweet as she could be yeah, friendly. I was there. Yeah. You were there. And, uh, and then I, but it was way down on the tidewater and it was no easy way to get there. Right. And we said, well, there's a party, there's a dinner, are you staying? And I said, no, I'm going back tonight. And we said, well, wh why are you doing that? And she says, well, you know, Ronnie, he misses me when I'm not there. I can tell. Now, Reagan was long lost to the mists of Alzheimer's, but she, and I thought, she's his actual caretaker. She's, the, she's doing this work. And I, I guess I think that most of the, if there were any holdouts, the American people, how she dealt with Alzheimer's won the last sort of people over. That's my impression. What do you think? Well, I've always been struck by how when he was president, she was criticized for being so protective of him. But when, when he got Alzheimer's, she was lauded for it. You know, it was sort same of- Same trait. Same, it, that was, Nancy didn't change. That's just the way she always was. Um, tell us the, tell the audience about the time. It's in your book that uh, Nancy Reagan forgot to introduce the president at his own oh, inauguration. Yeah. <laughs> she, yeah, apparently she got up and carried on for a while about, this was the, when we, when, the second inaugural. At Landover, when, a cold, cold day. And it was, it, we had to cancel all the events because it was so, um, it was dangerously cold and we couldn't have these kids marching in the band. And so they, they quickly, arranged for them all to be out at the Landover, whatever you call it, the arena of some kind. And, and the Reagans went out and she was asked to introduce him and she got up and she went on talking about how pleased they were the children were here and then, da, da, da. And then she sat down and she forgot to introduce him. So all of a sudden she went, oh, oh, and she stood up and went back up and said, I forgot to introduce my roommate. And she, so, so she, uh, she wasn't perfect. Well, yeah, but you know, I like that story because when people think of Nancy Reagan, they think, well, she didn't have a great sense of humor. Yeah. But there's little, you even have a chapter on her humor. It's not she, that big a chapter. She had a lovely sense of humor. Yes, but that, that, was, that illustrated that. Do you, any other things come to mind in that vein, Nancy's humor? She, she, three days before she died, she exhibited her humor. And she knew she was dying. Did but you have to, I want you to read the book. Yes, that, I, we, it's, we, it was the chapter I dreaded writing, <laughs> and it ended up being my favorite chapter in the whole book. Mine too. Uh, Lady in Red is a reported book <laughs> for you journalists out there. Uh, Sheila didn't just jot down her recollections. She called and interviewed people that she worked with, former colleagues in the White House, and some of them gave her such long answers. I noticed what she did. She put them, she has a chapter on some of their there are some of these people I, I imagine wrote down, wanted to, wrote it down, and there, that's yeah. a nice section there. Um, wh when you called people and told them you were doing this book, uh, what, what, kind of, what, what are some of your favorite reactions that you got? Well, the, I mean, the reason that I finally agreed to do it was how many people said to me um, that they wish more people knew what she was really like. And then I, when I would say, later that I decided I was going to write a book, they kept saying, you're the perfect person to do it. So that was kind of the reaction I got. And it was probably because I'd known her so long, I'd been her press secretary, um, and, I, and I knew how to write. <laughs> that was all I could think of. But uh, it was, you know, it was, it was funny because I just never, ever wanted to write a book. And, and it, it took this to sort it all out. Well, um, it sounds like it was cathartic for you. It was, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, that last chapter, I mean, it became evident. I, I think the reader knows this, but you remained friends. You became friends. Yeah, yeah. She's, it the sounds day, like the, the day I left, she said, from now on, call me Nancy. Before that, it was always Mrs. Reagan. And when, um, <coughs> excuse me, when my husband died in 98, she, for a solid year, she called me once a week. Really? Just to check in, see how I was doing. And she always tried to make me cry. And she said her father told her that 
grieving people need to cry, that it's good for them, it helps them. And, and, and really, you'd find, if you've had this experience, people are very uncomfortable um, about being with you and having you burst into tears. So uh, she would call me once a week, and she would figure out a way to get me to talk about it and, and to try her best to get me crying. And I kept thinking in the back of my mind, I'm losing an hour of billable time here <laughs> as I was at a PR firm. And, but it was, I mean, it, that's the way she was. She, she, when, when you were her friend, you were her friend. Uh, you have one chapter, The Perfectionist, mm -hmm. and, um, which is, you know, it's a, it's a very charitable portrait of a type A micromanager. Mm -hmm. But I wondered, are you like that yourself? I've had people, is this why you're so sympathetic? I've had people tell me that. I don't feel that I am. I feel like I'm always wishing I could be. Um, but um, I found it really easy to work for her because she was a perfectionist, because she knew what she wanted and she could convey it to you. And I've worked for people who had no idea what they wanted, and that was not my idea of a good time. Okay, but planning the White House Christmas party in August when it's 100 well, degrees? Well, that wasn't our fault. That was, you know, a lot of these long lead time magazines, and it was a tradition that, you know, this year it would be the Washington Post, the next year it would be somebody else. And yes, every, every August, the president and the first lady, we, we set up a Christmas tree, and they posed um, in winter attire, and it was usually 100 degrees outside in August. And the president, I can't tell you how patient he used to be. I mean, you, know, you know how photographers was, oh, one more picture, one more picture, and it goes on and on and on. And he, all, he just always was so gracious. Uh, Sheila, um, you know, I'm an old newspaper man, and we'd get these calls at the desk at night, usually from a bar, sometimes slurred <laughs> speech. This is before the Internet, and people don't walk around with all my acts in their pocket. Right. Settle a bet, they'd say. Ty Cobb's lifetime batting average, whatever the question was. So I'm going to ask you to settle a, a bar bet. Did Nancy Reagan hate the ranch? No, absolutely not. And in fact, there are a number of people in better position than I am to, to tell you that, but they told me. The guys who, who Dennis LeBlanc and, and the guys who were at the ranch, John Barletta, the Secret Service agent who, who was with him for 17 years because he was an equestrian and he rode with them. Um, and, but, but what they said is, Nancy Reagan started going to the ranch because Ronald Reagan loved it, but she became very fond of it. And for its, its tranquility and its relative privacy, I mean, you might have 50 Secret Service agents out in the woods, but at least it felt private and quiet, and, and it was where they relaxed. Um, speaking of the Reagans relaxing, Mark Weinberg, who worked in the White House when you were there and followed the Reagans out right. after the presidency, right. he's written a new book himself about watching movies with the Reagans. At Camp David. Most of them at Camp David, yeah. right. Did you ever do that? Did you ever get to watch movies with the Reagans? Uh, in the White House, yeah. I did, not what, at Camp David. What kind of experience was that? It was the movie Reds, when that came out. With uh, Warren Beatty? Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. But they, it, the stars were all there. And um, no, it was wonderful. And the president got up and introduced it. And, and um, I, I can't remember if you had popcorn or what, but but it was pretty early in the administration, as I recall. Yeah. And um, yeah, but, but they, every Saturday night when they were at Camp David, they had a movie. Um, so speaking of Hollywood, I mean, so the Reagans came out of Hollywood. It's one reason Nancy Reagan was able to do such a good job with the Bar Barbara Sison. You know, she was trained. She was mm -hmm. an actress, she sang her, she mm -hmm. could sing. Um, and it's become more common in recent years, especially, I guess, when a Democrat's in the White House, that Hollywood people are in Washington. But, it was a it was a kind of a new thing then mm -hmm. to have that many people, mm -hmm. and you listed some of them in your book: Robert Goulet, mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee, Bob Newhart, Beverly Sills, the great uh, opera singer, mm -hmm. Perry Como, Gene Kelly, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, did I mention Frank Tate? Yeah. Frank Tate. He'd be thrilled. All right, <laughs> Sheila's brother, a musician, accomplished musician. Um, but I got to ask you, what was Sinatra like? Um, Annoying. <laughs> he 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 hates hated the press, you know. Um, and so when he was there, he um, I just found him unpleasant most of the time. Frankly, I sat in one meeting with him, um, 
and he hardly opened his mouth. Um, but I will tell you, one time I was out in, at the Biltmore Hotel in, in uh, Phoenix, and she was staying at her mother's with her parents. And um, he called me from California and had me paged at the swimming pool. And you should have seen, I don't know how people knew it was him, but the, however it was announced, I can't remember, um, everybody, all eyes were on me. I mean, I was, a, I was the star. What was, what was I doing taking a call from Frank Sinatra, right? <laughs> but um, I think he, he'd, well, Chris Wallace tells the story that when he started doing this documentary at the end of the Reagan second term, um, he tried to, inter to interview Frank Sinatra, and Frank Sinatra made it so difficult. He insisted that there w they could edit nothing. And they, and they explained to him that if he went on and talked for three or four minutes, that, was, that would just be a killer for them. And they, if they couldn't edit that, that was a problem. And he refused, and so they never even talked to him for the piece. Oh. And he had the same reaction. It was, he was just very difficult. And, and at the same time, he, loved, he, he was there with Perry Como. Perry Como, the, I have a picture of Maureen Santini and Bar, um, um, Donnie Radcliffe and somebody else uh, standing, talking to Perry Como, and they're like this, <laughs> with a look in their Maureen face. Maureen Santini I was mean, a he, wire service reporter. Tough, the White House. Donnie really Radcliffe tough writers, worked you know. for the Washington Post. Yep. Um, so, well, let's talk about the women writers who covered Nancy Reagan and, and to a lesser degree, Ronald Reagan. Um, when I, I mentioned earlier the Joan Didion piece. So Joan Didion writes a piece for the Saturday Evening Post. This is, this is when she's still in California. When, when Reagan is governor. Mm -hmm. And she describes uh, the gaze, Nancy's famous loving look um, at Reagan as a study in frozen insincerity, <laughs> words that cut Nancy deeply. Um, so by the time she gets to Washington, she is not necessary. She's not one of these women who thinks a woman reporter is automatically going to be a good thing. Right. Did she ever warm up to the women journalists here in Washington who cover? Well, she certainly um, became more comfortable with them. Um, she spent a lot of time with Helen Thomas. I mean, you can't get any tougher than Helen. <laughs> um, uh, she got to know Donnie Radcliffe, um, Edith, or. Um, Nemi, what's her name? Naomi Nover. No, no. <laughs> no, the New York Times reporter, how can I forget her name? I forget her first name, but her last name is Nemi, N-E-M-Y. I don't know her. She's a, she was a wonderful reporter anyway. Uh, she's retired now, but um, there, there were some, and, in, in, um, you know, if, if she spent some time with Ann Blackman, um, did several long interviews with her. The... Uh... Uh, much has been written, my father's written it, Larry Barrett, other people have written about Nancy's influence, outsized influence in the White House. Um, as a person who worked there in the entire first term, for the staff, what were some of the manifestations of that, of that power, of that influence? Um, you know, she was only interested in him, in Ronald Reagan. She, she, I never saw her get very interested in anything policy related. Uh, she just worried about him and his image. And, um, but I, I mean, talking about, you know, because she was so well known as being so close to her husband, uh, that, that automatically signals some influence. You know, it, it scares people who, who, who they don't want to mess with her, right? And I can still remember um, Ed Rollins um, on the phone with her, and his hands were shaking. And we, we used to laugh because we, you know, we could say anything to her. We could, we had fun. We we didn't. We weren't afraid of her. For those of you who don't know Rollins, in those days, he he weighed about two twenty. Big guy. He, he was a weightlifter. He he grew up in Vallejo, on the tough side of East Bay, the tough part of San Francisco Bay Area, and he told me once uh, they used to go down where the Marines trained, and they'd get in bar fights with them, and Ed said, we ate Marines for breakfast. <laughs> but Nancy ate him for breakfast, it sounds like. Well, I, I don't necessarily think it was anything significant. He was just so... It was yard signs just, he was or a, something. Oh, it was the yards. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Stu Spencer 
tells the story of um, getting a call from Nancy and, and he sent Ed to talk to her and he, as Ed was leaving, Ed was the campaign manager for the 84 election. He said, he said, she's gonna try to roll you. Don't let her roll you. Um, she wanted, she'd gotten a call from some friends in LA saying there are no yard signs out here for Ronald Reagan. So she wanted more yard signs. He said, don't let her roll you. We're 20 points ahead. We don't need to spend the extra money. And, and, and Stu says that as, when Ed came back, he took one look at him and he said, she rolled you, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, the, the signs were popping up all over LA. <laughs> um, you have a fascinating vignette in your book um, from George Schultz. I'm actually not gonna have you relay it. I'm gonna tell people that they probably need to buy the book. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna give away all the nuggets Right, here. that's right. Um, but, um, Schultz is, is one of the people, he, she, and he, she found common purpose with him. She mm -hmm. was, you know, other, John Matlock's written about this. Uh, Alita Black has done an interesting revision history, giving Nancy credit for encouraging the kind of peace neat wing uh -huh, uh -huh. of the administration. Is that your impression as well? I think, I think she did that based on her real good, real sense that that would be good for Ronald Reagan as well as for America. Um, all right, I'm, this is a vignette that I'm going to make you relate. So um, this comes under the heading of the glamorous job of press aid. <laughs> Did you really once count how many times Nancy was chewing her food mm -hmm. before swallowing? Mm -hmm. tell, tell us about that. Well, there was a rumor circulating in, among the, the ladies of the press that the reason Nancy Reagan stayed so thin was that she always chewed her food 32 times before she swallowed it. So we get on a plane early one morning and she's eating breakfast. So I was sitting across from her and I was, she said, why are you staring at me? And I said, I'm counting how many times you chew your food. And she said, what are you talking about? So I told her and she said, that's ridiculous. I said, I know, I just counted. It was like 12 before she chewed it. So, and, and I said, I was kind of hoping it was true because then I could do it. <laughs> but that's, that kind of thing happened frequently. Well, you have a chapter in here, blame it on the first lady. Uh, what was the oddest thing that Nancy Reagan was ever blamed for in your experience? Well, there was the sumo wrestling. Um, she was, I got a call one day, um, and I, I can't remember who, but somebody, some reporter early in the morning called and said, we hear that Nancy Reagan has canceled a sumo wrestling contest that was meant for the Rose Garden later today. I said, <laughs> I said, that doesn't sound right, but I'll call you back. So I called her and I told her and she said, I didn't know anything about any sumo wrestling. I, when I let alone canceled it, she said, you know, sometimes I feel like if it's raining outside, it must be my fault. And I could understand her feeling that way. Um, you, you love Nancy Reagan, it's clear from this book. Mm -hmm. uh, you love Barbara Bush. You I did. Wrote, you wrote that in yep. this book. Yep. So it begs the question, why didn't Barbara Bush and Nancy Reagan love each other? You know, it's a mystery to me. <laughs> I don't know. In fact, I can tell you that George, the, when, you know, when I became George H.W. Bush's campaign press secretary in 88, we got on our first uh, plane trip get off the plane, he says, ride in the limo with me. I thought, oh, I done something wrong already. <laughs> and get in the car, and as we're pulling out, he said, Sheila, why didn't Nancy Reagan like my wife? Really? And it, you know what, it was the first time I knew it. Because Nancy Reagan, first of all, never gossiped. And she certainly didn't gossip with us. I never heard her say a negative word about Barbara Bush. I had no idea there was tension between them. Um, and he just looked at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> and, and he dropped the subject. But, but he knew it. He knew it. I didn't know it. Um, I think, well. Um, it, you, know, you know what I think? Yeah. It, one, of my, one of my beliefs is that when, when candidates run against each other, when it's over, they make peace. But sometimes the wives take all that more personally. I don't know, Sheila. You took... Reagan took, he took Bush's chief of staff to be his I chief know. of staff, Jimmy Baker. And actually Nancy. Made him Secretary of State. Right, Nancy he took, approved Reagan, it. He took Bush as the vice president. Yeah, I know. Um, and so Reagan forgave them all. It doesn't mean Nancy did. Yeah. 
Um, maybe voodoo economics stuck in her craw. She blamed Barbara. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to sort of tie the knot here with one thing. Um, I didn't know Joan Didion, although we're both from California. But in terms of the study in frozen insincerity look, uh, the, the postscript on that was written by the Reagans himself. Uh, Nancy once once said, my life didn't really begin until I met Ronnie. Uh -huh. uh, Reagan, uh, who met his second wife when she was a studio starlet was the term people used then at, uh -huh. at MGM. Uh, her name was Nancy Davis, felt the same way. He said, uh, and then along came Nancy Davis and saved my soul. Uh -huh. They were so close that the, that frozen remark is interesting because their own kids often felt frozen out between the two of them. Uh -huh. so, what do you think, you were there, what was their secret of that kind of love? They each put each other first, always. When, when he came home from work, from the, from the Oval Office, he came upstairs, the first, first thing he did was go find her. I mean, she was first, and, he, and, and it was equal. I mean, that's the way they were. And, and Nancy Reagan said that with regard to watching, you know, staring at him while he spoke, she said, I believe that anyone who speaks, you should watch them. I think, she said, I think it's the, it's the courteous thing to do. And that's, that was her rule. Um, all right, well, let's, let's take a, a few, we have time for some questions. Um, how does it work here? There's a, there's a microphone. Um, you don't mind questions, right? It's like, no, it's of like course on, not. It's like we're on C-SPAN. My whole life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila, yeah. T Sheila uh, Howard Marks here. So um, you mentioned about uh, her father, Dr. Loyal Davis, uh -huh. being so, quoting, when he was, uh, when you were in mourning, yes. that she called you weekly and then quoted her dad. Uh -huh. Well, my grandmother, blessed memory, was a patient of Dr. Davis in oh, Chicago. Really? And uh, my mother told me that uh, when Dr. Davis was making morning rounds, he would bring his, do his adopted daughter, Nancy Davis, uh -huh. with him uh -huh. on the adopted rounds. Uh -huh. So you mentioned her as a caregiver to, the, to President Reagan while he was suffering Alzheimer's. Uh -huh. Maybe uh, I would think that he, she may have picked that up from her dad and especially going around, helping him on morning rounds, et cetera. So I just I, wanted I, to throw that out. I don't have a question. I have no doubt about it. I mean, she, she adored him. She used to go up in the observation area and watch him perform neurosurgery. She just, she thought he walked on water. Of course, he, you know, she had, she had lived in Bethesda with an aunt and uncle while her mother was a, an actress. And when her mother married Loyal Davis, it was the first permanent home she ever had. And, and he had, when he adopted her, she, she used to get very annoyed when a reporter would say, your stepfather, she said, he's my father. And then he adopted her, and, and uh, she wasn't, wouldn't think of him any other way. She had a pretty rough life. I mean, her, her, her parents divorced when she was an infant. Yes. Uh, her father was a car salesman who mm -hmm. lived in New York City. Maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, those really early years? I mean, it, it's a story that's really not been told a lot about, well, about that. Thank you. Nancy tried, I think Nancy lost it over a lot, you know, because she did love the, 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 um, her mother's sister that she stayed with, she, but she said, they weren't my parents, you know. I, I, I always longed to be with my mother. Um, and she remained friends with, with you know, with the, her aunt and uncle and, and their family. And, and um, Dick Davis is still alive, her, her adopted brother. And um, in fact, if I can diverge a minute, Dick told me a really interesting story. I absolutely was convinced that the reason Nancy was so insecure, if that's the right word, which resulted, which resulted in protectiveness and he said, no, that's nothing to do with it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, Nancy Reagan was, um, <clears throat> how do I say this? Um, she, he said she exactly, she picked up the exact 
uh, way her mother acted. And she said when, he, when, when Edie married um, Loyal Davis, it, she became very protective of him. And, and he said, if anyone dared say anything even slightly um, critical of Loyal Davis, I can still hear his voice. He said, he was laughing as he said it. He said, the wrath of Edie would descend upon them. <laughs> and, you know, if you think so about she it, like her mom. She, she, <laughs> she did what her mother did. Interesting. Yeah. Um, are there other questions? If not, I'll ask you a final one. Any other questions? I want to make sure. All right. There's no way to know this, but I'm going to take a stab at it. So if you had published this book before Nancy had passed away and she read it, what do you think she would call you and say? She'd laugh. I think, she'd, I think she would enjoy it. Great, great. Well, Sheila Tate, thank you very much. I enjoyed this, and I thank hope you. all of you who read it will, too. Thanks. Appreciate it.